Okay, thank you, Victoria. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second day of August faculty workshops, first workshop of the day. Um, joining us here for balancing structure and flexibility to promote student thriving. I think a theme that we've already heard come up a lot in the first day sessions in the plenary yesterday. Um, so really glad to have everyone joining for this conversation. I'm Hannah Jardine. I am one of the teaching and learning specialists here at CTRL and also an adjunct uh, faculty member in the School of Education. And I'm uh, Matt Kreit, I use they them pronouns, and I am also a teaching and learning specialist here at CTRL. All right, so a few guidelines for participation this morning, and if you were in any of our sessions yesterday, you're very familiar with these, but um, for those who haven't seen them, um, throughout this workshop and all of our workshops, we ask that you make yourself comfortable first and foremost. So. Um, whatever makes you comfortable this morning, enjoy your coffee, your tea, your breakfast, um, relax, stim, rock, fidget, knit, craft as needed, um, be present. So we will have a few opportunities for you to participate um, individually, um, potentially in group discussion. If you're interested, we will give lots of options and choice throughout the session for how you want to participate and engage with us. Uh, please feel free to ask questions or share ideas in the chat at any time, uh, and one of us will um, get back to you and or bring it up with the whole group. Use the raise hand function to speak, with, which is under reactions, and certainly be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. We're here to learn from each other today. Um, and just uh, a little bit of a meta moment. These are some types of guidelines you might introduce to your students at the start of class or even develop with your students at the start of class uh, or at the start of the semester. And um, we intentionally design our workshops to be very active because evidence shows that's what's effective. So especially in a morning session, we're here to get you thinking um, and actively engaged at the start of the day. So with that, um, we're interested to hear from you, um, your thoughts on where you might fit in terms of flexibility and structure in thinking about what brought you to the session today um, or how you might define these things before we get into our own definitions. So we've set this up so that um, can be a Zoom annotation activity. So we have this empty chart and the directions in the bottom right say to click view options, which should be at the top of your screen. And then if you go to annotate and then stamp, you can pick a stamp to add to this chart. Um, so I'll model, I would pick a, a heart that um, say we have high structure and high flexibility. Can I click there? I might not be able to participate, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm starting to see one star on there. So they're all coming in. And it looks like there's pretty wide variety in where we are. Um, what's interesting to me is I'm noticing nobody's ranking themselves low in terms of flexibility, but there are some lows in terms of structure. The structure range seems to be across the board and the flexibility range is a little bit more, um, a little bit more centered around higher flexibility, which um, be interested to know if anybody wants to add into the chat or, or share if, if this has changed or even something for you to think about as you're reflecting on your answer here, um, where were you maybe five years ago or three years ago um, or maybe before the pandemic? And has the pandemic changed the way we view flexibility in our classrooms? Because uh, I'd say as an instructor, it certainly has for me um, and maybe for others as well. Any other thoughts, Mac, as you're seeing uh, what came out of this? I think it's just really valuable to see that there is that uh, variety there that you know some people are higher structure some people are higher flexibility and I hope that that comes through to uh, in our session today that there is a lot of variability and all of these things that we're going to talk about um, and some of which you probably already know uh, fit under this flexible structure kind of uh, idea or framework and there's there's a lot of flexibility in how you can implement flexible structure. 
Absolutely. And that there is, I think we also want to communicate that there is not necessarily a right place to be on this chart or a right answer, or even you might find that you're, you would put a different stamp um, or put your stamp in a different place, depending on the course that you're teaching or depending on the point in the semester. Uh, maybe we move towards higher structure towards the end of the semester, um, for example. So all sorts of things to reflect on as you're thinking about where you fit in this um, in this graphic. So I'm gonna save this um, annotation. For those of you who have never used Zoom annotation, and if you are teaching remote or ever having any remote meetings, even with students, uh, it's great to use to, um, you could do things like this where people are stamping themselves on a chart. You could have an empty slide and have people text and write um, or add text to the slide and write their answers. You can use this to draw on things if you're showing sharing screen. So just a cool tool to keep your back pocket. All right, and I see Harmaine, I hope I pronounced that right. Let me know if not, um, definitely become way more flexible because honestly, it's just easier for me to say, okay, here's an extension or things like that. So I'm trying to quote argue with a student. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that today and what is flexibility easier? When, when does flexibility then too much flexibility become not as easy and where is that um, sweet spot. All right, so I'm going to clear off all the drawings and then we'll talk about our workshop outcomes. So by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to articulate the value of both structure and flexibility in promoting an equitable and inclusive learning environment, examine the diversity of student needs and experiences that may lead them to require different levels of structure and flexibility, and also select instructional approaches that promote student autonomy and choice while maintaining a structured course. Thank you, Megan, also for sharing your ideas about extensions and such. I'm sure more and more ideas will come up throughout the session, so please feel free to share them. All right, so before we get into how we're defining structure and defining flexibility and envisioning these things, uh, we'd love to hear from you again um, what words come to mind when you think of, um, in this case, structure, and then we'll also do this activity for flexibility. I will drop the link um, in the chat for you to access this poll, and then you'll um, submit one word answers and we'll start to create a word cloud together. So what words come to mind when you think of structure? And the way the word cloud works is that the more commonly answered words will show up larger. Um, so we see rigid and rigidity as very common. Schedule, also predictable, organized, routine, deadlines, discipline, guided, focused, scaffolding. These are all great words. Um, some of these words we could interpret as negative words, but we can also interpret them in a positive way. Um, what we hope to communicate today is that both structure and flexibility are very important, very valuable. Um, so sometimes it is important and helpful to have things like strictness or rigidity um, or guidelines or deadlines, responsibility. All right, thank you for that. So it says the activity is full. Uh, we are using the free version of Poll Ever if you're interested in using it in your course, but it does come with a limited number of responses, unfortunately. Um, so then the second question would be, what words come to mind when you think of flexibility? And that same link should just change to this question. Mm, personalized, smiley face, <laughs> choice, confusion, interesting, empathy, 
responsive reassurance complications, authenticity, ownership, freedom, very awesome words here as well. I'm interested um, to see how big confusion ended up. Um, so I don't know that that's a word we were thinking about, Mac, but it is important to think about how um, flexibility without structure maybe can become confusing, can become um, students feeling like they have to kind of figure out or set their own deadlines or um, kind of not sure what you're asking for, what your expectations might be. So it's certainly something to think about when we're thinking about flexibility. Is there a point where we reach too much flexibility and not enough guidance, structure, um, scaffolding, routine, all those sorts of things? Uh, anything you're noticing, Mac, that you want to bring up from either of these two word clouds? I think you got it, Hannah. I just love that the little smiley face ended up in the middle of choice. Um, I know. I that's, <laughs> that's a fun part of pull everywhere. Yeah, I wonder if they how their algorithm works that out, but very cool. Right, so our definition of structure is repetitive of many of the words that you've already shared. Um, so we've ha we're highlighting framework and organization of a course and a learning experience, creating a stable foundation that helps students understand expectations and goals. And this foundation leads to um, what the evidence shows and uh, research on how students learn or how people learn is that a foundation can lead to greater motivation and engagement. That way students and learners can focus on the learning and not on the guesswork. Uh, so that might include clear learning objectives or learning outcomes, both for the course or even for that class that day or a certain assignment, a well-defined curriculum, established guidelines for learning activities or directions, um, a predictable class routine, maybe every week things are due at the same time or your class agenda kind of goes in the same um, flow. So that predictability is really a big part of structure and, and a big part of decreasing anxiety um, so that students can focus more on learning. Um, in terms of flexibility, I think a lot of these words also came up in the word cloud, adaptability and personalized learning experiences. I know personalized is one of the big ones. Uh, enabling students to explore their unique interests, nurturing creativity and critical thinking. So students have the freedom to approach tasks in diverse ways, being responsive. I think all of these words are part of that word cloud. Responsive to the notion that life happens even for the most well-prepared students and instructors. Um, so we want to highlight that too much flexibility, I think this came up in the word cloud, is coming up in um, what we're seeing here, too much flexibility is unfair or unclear. Um, students are still learning to manage their time and priorities, and we are the experts who help them build those skills. So that's where we get into that, where is flexibility too much, or the, the confusion that you all mentioned in the word cloud. Um, so this uh, presentation, and I know in the title, we say balancing structure and flexibility. And I think during the plenary yesterday, even the concept of is balance even a thing came up, right? So we're saying that the goal isn't really to balance as if these are opposites, but that they really should and can exist at the same time. So the best of both worlds would be a flexible structure. Uh, so with a strong intentional foundation, you can be more responsive to students. So if you aim for your courses and teaching to be organized and intentional and still recognize that adjustments will need to be made, um, that structure, can potentially even allow for more flexibility. So um, having that anchor or that foundation can allow you to make those changes when needed. Why is this so important? Uh, it's learner-centered and empowers students and instructors. Uh, both the concepts of structure and flexibility align with a variety of equity-based instructional frameworks. So universal design for learning, you know, our group talks about a lot uh, and has came, came up in multiple sessions yesterday. Um, this idea of providing multiple means of expression, action, and representation, um, so giving students choice, but within a framework of the course and within specific learning outcomes or specific curriculum, um, trauma-informed teaching, two of the um, focus of trauma-informed teaching are safety and trustworthiness, which we might say align with structure, but choice is also a huge part of trauma-informed teaching, which aligns a little bit more flexibility. So in order to apply all of the concepts from trauma-informed teaching, we'd be um, thinking about both structure and flexibility. And culturally responsive teaching talks a lot about providing rigorous routine and relevant curriculum, which 
we argue is a little bit more on the side of structure, but in a welcoming, caring, and authentic environment, which um, can be a part of the flexibility side. So a little bit more research just to show um, how much of a difference structure can make and also flexibility. Um, this study demonstrated that increased core structure promoted student achievement, uh, especially for black and non-traditional students. So on the left, you can see a chart that shows the difference between what happened um, or traditional lecture and increased structure and the impact that would have on predicted exam performance. And that structure included more pre-class work, more guided readings, more recitations. It's really more guidance and less guesswork. Um, so these student populations were compared based on race on the left and then on in terms of first generation versus continuing generation on the right. And so you can see for all groups, the increased structure led to higher performance, but um, the difference are greatest for more minoritized populations. And this relates to something we refer to as the hidden curriculum. So often for minoritized populations, um, and especially first generation students who are coming in without um, parents having been through the traditional university system and not being kind of taught implicitly or explicitly all of the quote, rules or expectations for what it means to be in higher education or to be a university student um, with more structure, then students are more aware of those those implicit ideas are made more explicit for students. So increasing achievement for all. And then here's a study from a graduate program, but just also to argue that more structure, uh, the importance of more structure. So this um, more structured graduate program produced more equitable publication rates. So in the chart, you can see the chemistry graduate program, um, the red line or the line on the bottom of each set is the underrepresented minority group then women and non underrepresented minority men are all compared in chemistry, the publication rates were all generally equal. Um, but in the other disciplines, they were much more distinct or further apart. Um, so increasing structure can um, increase publication rates or just in general achievement for these graduate students. So that structure included making the implicit and explicit publication expectations clear, not expecting these graduate students to figure it out, um, checking in on their progress via advisors or early incorporation of research. So even if you're not um, working with graduate students or teaching graduate level coursework, um, these lessons I think could apply to any really learning environment. The, the importance of making expectations clear and checking in with students as you go. Uh, also, a quote from our student partners who worked with us last semester, um, undergraduate students giving insight into the student experience. So this quote says that sometimes giving students options to be creative is too open. It's often a foreign concept to us. So they're even recognizing that too much flexibility is maybe not such a good thing or too much choice, but we need the tools in order to do the right thing. We're students, not mind readers. So I appreciate the mentorship from instructors. So I'll close this up by saying flexibility is helpful until it becomes chaos. And here, these graphics are aiming to represent that, that we want to have options, but maybe not too many options. Uh, and then structure is helpful until it becomes too rigid. So we want to have a foundation, but without building um, a big wall or blockage um, or boundary preventing students from really achieving the course goals and learning outcomes. So this relates to or a concept that comes up a lot when we talk about structure or flexibility is this idea of rigor um, and that we do not want to communicate here that flexibility means lower expectations or less rigor, but that we want to consider the difference between intellectual and logistical rigor. So with a high, um, high structure and high flexibility, we can maximize intellectual rigor, rigor which is the critical thinking and knowledge and skill development but we're minimizing that logistical rigor, which would be the unclear expectations and confusion that leads to distress about what the professor wants. Um, so we can focus on high achievement intellectually and less on um, kind of the guesswork in learning. So with all of that, um, we presented a lot of maybe new ideas or, or reaffirming ideas for you. Um, so we'll just check in before I turn things over to Mac for our next section. 
um, how everybody's feeling about or thinking about these topics. So in what ways are you thinking about structure and flexibility differently now? Or are you thinking about it differently? Or is this more uh, validating and reaffirming a lot of the ideas that you already had? So please feel free to share any ideas in the chat. I think we're a little ahead on time if anybody would like to share out loud as well. I see Naoko, I would like to know by example what high structure and flexibility course is like, and that is what we are about to get into. So um, we started this presentation more with the, the what and the why, and then we will get into the how. Other comments in the chat? Simon's comment, so attempting this hybrid approach, um, providing structured op options and topic focus or subject and room for students to choose their own direction. Um, so this reminded me of sometimes we talk about concept of if you're thinking about flexible structure and you want to give students choice, you might decide to give them choice in topic or choice in format. And sometimes it works out that you could offer both. Um, but for example, if your learning outcome is really that students are developing presentation skills, they're all expected to give a relatively similar presentation with similar criteria for what's expected in that presentation, but they can choose from a variety of topics. Or if um, it's more, your learning outcomes are more focused on specific content, you might choose to give them choice in the way they demonstrate their knowledge of that content through say an infographic versus, um, a short video versus um, a writing assignment or something. I see we, yeah. I, yeah. I was just, I was just gonna add, I think, <laughs> I think what you just said really relates to what Simon mentioned in the chat about experimenting with like uh, structure and a few like hybrid options. So they mentioned, uh, structured options and topic focus or subject while including room for students to choose their own direction. So building in that structure, but also having that flexibility there so students have some choice. So I just wanna highlight that, you know, what you said is is very similar to what, uh, I think what some of our participants are experiencing. Mm. And do you wanna talk more about your response to Jenny's comment about extroverted sure. and introverted students and Sure. So uh, Jenny mentioned in the chat, um, for those of you that can't see, uh, that uh, they're worried about extroverted students who are more willing to ask for extensions, but those shy students don't ask and maybe are unfairly punished because they're not aware that they're able to ask for the extension or they're just not comfortable doing so. And I'll say that was definitely my experience as an undergraduate. I was offered extensions by uh, instructors, but I didn't really understand how to use them or uh, feel comfortable reaching out to the professor to ask for them. So I just did my assignments, turned them in and was very stressed about it. Um, but one of the options that you might have to, to get at that issue of having students that are worried about asking for extensions or they maybe they don't even want to um, reach out to the professor to ask for them is to use something called tokens. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later today. Um, when we get to the strategy section, but it's an option that basically gives students like they have a few extensions that they can use throughout the semester and they don't have to reach out to you to use them. They just use them and say on the assignment, hey, I use this token so that I can turn it in late. Um, and what we also find, which I'll also mention that I think uh, Arthur uh, reiterated, is that um, it's not just the shy students that may be less likely to ask for extensions, it's also our students that are perhaps less privileged or less experienced with college. They don't know that extensions even really exist. Um, and they are still figuring out how to, um, you know, how to navigate college. 
and how to navigate this whole new kind of system without any or without with less support perhaps than our uh, students who are second gen or further. Um, so some of these uh, strategies that we'll talk about, like the tokens, uh, can help address that. Um, and uh, I see we have a hand up. If you wouldn't mind pronouncing your name, I don't want to. Um... Sure, no problem. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Atiyaf. Atiyaf. Great. Uh, Thank you. You know, I just wanted to add. It's also for international students. I taught abroad for a while, and the cultural differences are really, really. You notice it. So culturally, in many countries. Students don't necessarily well, won't ask for extensions. They won't know mm -hmm. they have the right for that. Or and they, even if even if the let's say the professor says you have the right for extension, they might be too shy to ask for that. And so just having that in mind, flexibility can be also very overwhelming as well because they're not used to that. So maybe even explaining the point of why we're doing this and mm -hmm. just addressing naming that. This might be might feel a bit uncomfortable for some of you. If that's the case, come and talk to me. That's just yes, yeah, some maybe some ways of addressing it. Thank you so much for sharing that, Atiyah. It That's I think you could basically give them uh, the next sections of our of our presentation because that transparency is so key. And just talking with them about extensions and why you might need them, that it's okay to ask for them. I think a lot of students, uh, like Shed mentioned in the chat, they may think it's a sign that they're not working hard enough or that they're not achieving or that they're perhaps um, disappointing you as an instructor and talking to them and just saying, it's okay to ask for extensions. I've asked for extensions and, and I'm still here. And so you can as well. All right, Mac, do you, um, yeah, yeah, wait time. <laughs> I was just gonna ask if you had any other uh, points you wanted to bring up, Hannah. No, no, I think um, I appreciate those of you who shared your ideas in the chat. I think as we go over some of these strategies um, continue to come up. Absolutely. All right, so can I take over with the slides now, Hannah? Sorry, okay. could you, uh, yeah, could I, could I share them for my screen? Thanks, yeah. Right. Here. Moving. All right. We see a uh, presenter view. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, All right. Does that look great? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Too many windows open. All right, great. Um, so what we're going to do now is address that uh, second outcome, which was thinking about the diversity of experiences uh, for our students. So we're going to go into some details about kind of the state of our students um, and some of the things that you may or may not know about uh, about students. And I'll also just offer a brief content notice right here um, before we move into the next section. We are going to touch on mental health. Um, just in this next slide, so please do what you need to keep yourself comfortable and safe during this time. So what we're going to start with is pushing back against this myth of the normal student. So you may hear folks mention, well, you know, typically all of my students are this way, so I'm just going to teach to that average student, that middle student, and everything will be fine. Um, and we're going to push back against that by just trying to uh, push back against this myth that there really isn't a normal student. There isn't a typical student. Everyone has a lot of different, um, uh, everyone's different and everyone has different needs and different supports. So if you can build that into your course, you can help get ahead of um, any uh, issues that may come up. So uh, to give you some, some details and some statistics about our student, about our current students, uh, 
in 2020 to 2021, over 60% of students met clinical criteria for at least one mental health problem. So a mental health problem is very broad and not specific, but this still highlights that students have a lot of outside factors that are contributing to their ability to be fully present in class. We've also seen uh, data that suggests that one in five students has struggled with suicidal ideation. And that's from uh, very recently, that data is from 2022. So roughly 20% of our students, and this is, this is broadly, this is not specifically at AU, um, are struggling with suicide and suicidal ideation and mental health um, concerns and challenges. So we need to keep that in mind as we're developing our courses and making sure that we build in the structure and flexibility so that we can reduce some of that anxiety and that cognitive load like Hannah mentioned earlier. Um, we've mentioned first generation college students a lot. So just as a reminder, that means students that had uh, didn't have parents or grandparents or anything, one who went to college prior to them, they may have had a sibling but importantly, they don't have access to that cultural capital, um, as, similarly to those students who have parents who went to college. So they can't ask them, what are office hours? Or how do I ask for an extension? Or how do I study? Instead, they have to get that information themselves or rely on their peers or faculty members to help them gather that information. But here at AU, about uh, over 10% of our students are first-generation college students. So they meet that definition of that criteria. And then thinking about accommodations, um, so ASAC, uh, Academic Support and Access Center, I believe is the correct acronym, um, last uh, two years ago supported more than 1,300 students. So that's about 10% of the student body. So if you have a class of 20 students, you likely have at least two, if not more, who are being uh, supported or helped out by uh, ASAP and the accommodation system here at AU. But what's important to note about accommodations is that they really are an, an inadequate solution. So it takes money and time and just a lot of effort to get a diagnosis. And here at AU and most universities, you are required to get a, a diagnosis from a medical professional before you're able to get any sort of accommodations in the classroom. And I'll even note, if you think about it, um, it's perhaps the hardest for these folks who need uh, accommodations to go through this really rigorous process where pages and pages of documentation are required um, this diagnosis is required. It's lots of communication and emails between people, phone calls between people. And our students that are the ones who need these accommodations tend to be the ones who have a harder time going through this process. So what we'd like to have you think about is incorporating some principles like Hannah mentioned. So this universal design for learning principles, which allow you to be proactive regarding our student differences instead of retroactively providing accommodations. Of course, there will always be times when students need accommodations. Um, we can't, we obviously can't um, uh, plan for every single eventuality that we have in our classroom. Again, why this flexible structure is really important. Um, but so you will still need to uh, accommodate some accommodations, but you can help head off some of those typical ones by using some universal design principles. So I have another student quote about deadlines and mental health. Um, so this is from one of those CTRL student partners that Hannah mentioned. Um, so when it comes to deadlines, knowing who your students are is important. Sometimes mental health challenges can lead our students to see deadlines as threatening and, and stressful. And I'll note here that uh, deadlines are difficult for lots of people, um, including faculty and staff. Uh, as, as a faculty member, have you ever asked for an extension in your work? I know I have. And um, I think it's really important to think about the question of whether or not should students should be provided with that same flexibility and ability to learn how to ask for extensions and manage that extra time in the same way that we do as faculty and staff. And we'll talk about um, a lot of options that you have when it comes to deadlines once we get to that strategy section towards the end. We also want to push back against this myth of the lazy student. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is not AU data, but this is more general. The information may be slightly different for AU, um, but there are some key takeaways that we can have. So the total number of students that we see working, so this is working anywhere from part-time to full-time, including both graduate students and undergraduate students, um, is about 70%. So about 70% of undergraduate students and graduate students have some sort of job while they are in college. And that's a pretty big increase from even 10, 15 years ago. 
when we think about undergraduates, about 40% are working at least 30 hours a week. So let me say that again, 30%, 40% of our students are working at least 30 hours a week. So that's a huge time commitment when we think, when a lot of times people think about a full-time student as attending school 40 hours a week, and then they're also working 30 hours a week on top of that. And the reason that these students are typically working that they mentioned in, the, in some of these reports is to pay for basic necessities, right? Everything is very expensive now, rent, food, travel, car costs, um, anything else that you can really think of, everything's very expensive. And students need to be able to meet these basic necessities. And they have to do that by working. Um, if we think about the graduate students who are working at least 30 hours a week, that's seven, uh, that's 7.5 out of 10. So about 75% of graduate students are working at least 30 hours a week outside of their coursework. And then lastly, um, thinking about undergraduates with caregiving responsibilities. So this could be caring for a child, caring for a parent, caring for siblings, someone else in their life that they have to provide caregiving responsibilities to um, is about 30%. So that's also a very large number and that what caregiving means can all can be, you know, a small assistant, uh, a small help, you know, once or twice a week where you're babysitting maybe your younger siblings or it can be a full-time job of taking care of a child or an elderly aging parent. So what's important to note is that uh, with all of this information that we've shared is that there's a lot of uh, different responsibilities that undergraduates and graduate students have today that they maybe didn't even have 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, we need to keep in mind that these commitments are from outside of the classroom, um, that these commitments from outside of the classroom really can impact their ability to achieve and be fully present in our classrooms. So this flows really nicely into another student quote that I have, which is that students don't procrastinate just to procrastinate. We hope that students, uh, that instructors reflect on whether they are villainizing the student or making assumptions. It comes down to trust and transparency. We do need guidelines and structure, but not punishment. So it's really important to think about not making assumptions about students' intentions or why they need that flexibility, regardless of how they look, how they've interacted in class, what other things they're bringing to the table. We really should try not to make assumptions about why a student may be turning something in late or they're uh, asking for an extension or that additional flexibility. They're likely not doing it. They're not doing it to make your life harder. They're not doing it because they Typically, they're not just doing it because they hate deadlines and they have pushed it off till the end. They're doing it because they have other responsibilities, such as working 30 hours a week, that can uh, cut into their ability, their time, and their uh, ability to complete assignments or assessments that we get. All right. So I, I just went through a lot of content, um, and I don't see many notes uh, in the chat. Is there anything that I missed while uh, talking, Hannah? Oh, no. Okay, great. Um, so what we're going to do now is since we've just talked a lot, we're going to give you all a chance to talk. Um, so we're going to model flexible structure here. So we know breakout rooms, some people like them, some people don't. And we totally understand that, uh, especially in the morning, sometimes you're just like, I don't want to talk to people today. And that's okay. So we're going to provide you with that flexibility here. Um, so you can either work in a breakout room when we invite you to one, or you can reflect independently in this main room, noting that the presenters will likely be talking about logistics of the next portion of our section of our presentation if you do remain in that main room. Um, so the questions that we'd like you to consider either individually or with your group um, are, what are some of the challenges that you faced related to balancing structure and flexibility in your teaching? What are your thoughts on what we've shared regarding the student perspective? What else have you heard from students that maybe we missed? Um, and how might this information inform your course this year? Hannah just shared those questions in the chat and that should move with you into the breakout rooms if you uh, decide to go there so that you know what questions we're asking you. And that's another really great strategy to use in class. If you are giving students questions to respond to, either share them in the chat or somewhere so that they know what they're supposed to be talking about. Um, and as we, uh, as we move into the breakout rooms, um, what questions do we have or do we have any questions? All right, 
I think you'll have about 15 minutes in the breakout rooms. Is that right, Hannah? I'm going to do 12. So okay. make sure we have enough time for all the strategies after we come back. Yeah. All right, great. So those uh, breakout rooms will open uh, soon slash now. Um, and feel free to join if you'd like or hang back in this main room. room about um, how do we support instructors that or perhaps TAs, graduate students that are trying to provide this flexibility, but maybe want to do all of their grading at the same time, right? So you, uh, so basically what we talked about and what we'll get into in the strategy section is you can set those limits. It's okay to give students not an indefinite uh, extension, like they don't need necessarily an extension till the end of the semester because that could put them behind or it could put you behind in terms of grading. Um, it could limit your ability to give them feedback in a, in a reasonable amount of time. So it's, it's okay to give them that um, kind of extension deadline at a very set date, not just a general, like you can turn it in whenever you want or you can turn it in at the end of the semester. So that builds in that structure, but also allows for that flexibility. And again, these things can be conversations with your students. Um, I, I, I find, and I think a lot of folks find that just being transparent about why your policies are the way they are um, is a really good way of getting kind of getting everybody on board um, and making sure students know that you're not doing this just because you are a really big stickler for deadlines. Instead, it's because you want to give them feedback within a reasonable amount of time so that they can apply it to their next assignments or assessments. All right. Yeah, um, because I care about you and your learning, I can offer you up to a two day extension. <laughs> Those sorts of freezing, right? All right, so I think maybe we have, I think we have time for uh, maybe one or two people if they'd like to share any of the takeaways that you got from your, uh, from chatting in your breakout rooms. Uh, if there's anything that you'd like to share verbally, uh, feel free to raise your hand. And if you're, uh, yeah, now go. I I was just telling the um you know, I've been teaching AU for 10 years now. Then I learned they are busy and I believe the structure is because 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 of not student are normal, every student have unique reason we need structure. And then I became flexible on my I think I apply my flexibility of number of assignment to reduce the number and give more time each assignment in the structure, but every assignment they ask for extension. The each assignment build up on next assignment. So and also we cannot extend the semester. Mm -hmm. So it's like really hard for me to how much I should give extension. But you know, if I give an extension next to like lecture, they don't really understand why we are doing this and they are getting behind. Also, attendance is really hard. How so I think how to be flexible, but they don't get to like piled up towards the end of the semester. And also attendance is and we didn't have any creative. Uh, solution for that issue. Well, uh, now that that uh, flows perfectly into the first set of strategies that we're going to give. So I'll go, um, I'll move ahead to those strategies and feel free to jump in um, or put in the chat if there are other questions that you still have as we're as we're chatting about this. All right, so let's talk about some strategies uh, for flexible structure. And if you've been in one of our sessions before, um, what you likely should expect is that we're going to present a lot of strategies um, and it may be overwhelming to see all of these strategies and think that you need to apply all of them and that is not the case. Uh, you choose what works best for you. Um, not all of these strategies will work for everyone. Um, 
and you can you can pick what works best for you and your students in your own course context. And before we even start the section, what I do want to do is say it is okay to set deadlines. It is okay to set um, uh, to have strict uh, aspects of your course. <laughs> that is an okay uh, boundary that you are able to set as an instructor. You do not need to be infinitely flexible or infinitely um, uh, infinitely flexible. Thanks, Mac. So. <laughs> And we're going to talk about flexibility in terms of course policies, uh, flexibility in terms of assignments, individual class se sessions, and finally, flexibility in terms of course design. So kind of four different lenses that you can use to think about flexible structure. So flexible structure and course policies, the evergreen uh, topic of attendance policies, right? Do we require attendance? Do we allow students flexibility? How do we, how do we manage uh, attendance policy flexibility? So my suggestion here is to just consider attendance policy flexibility and what might that look like for you. So some people will offer, um, will say no attendance is required and just let students come when they can. Um, some students may or some professors may not uh, may not want that uh, want that approach. So some options that you have for students that are attending in person classes is to offer a Zoom or an online option. Um, that may be difficult to set up depending on the type of classroom that you are in. So an option that you have instead of setting it up yourself could be to have a buddy system. So students are paired up with a buddy at the beginning of the semester. And if they're going to be late or, or they're going to miss a class, they reach out to their buddy and they say, hey, I'm, I'm going to miss this in-person class, but I'd like to come on Zoom. And then they can coordinate with a student in the class to get into a Zoom uh, Zoom room for the class that day. You can also offer a few free absences per semester. And what's important to note is that you want to give credit for learning activities, or what we would suggest is giving credit for learning activities, not necessarily just attending class. So not having a participation grade, but instead you have an activity that you do during class, you collect it, students submit it and then that's what they get their participation points for for the day as opposed to simply attending class. We also encourage you to definitely set deadlines, but potentially provide due date flexibility in a way that works for you. So here this could be something like a deadline range or suggested due dates. Something that I tend to do is kind of soft deadlines and grace days. So I usually have assignments due on like a Friday around noonish. Um, but I don't tend to start grading until Saturday or Sunday. And I explicitly say that to my students, our deadline is this time, but I likely won't start grading until Sunday. So you have until Sunday to turn it in. They tend to want to follow that first deadline, um, but a, a concern that you may have and something that does happen is students start to see that second deadline as the actual deadline. So that's something to keep in mind if you try out a soft deadline or grace days type of approach. Um, another policy that you can think about uh, in terms of flexible structure in, in your course policies is to think about alternative grading. So some of these alternative grading practices, such as ungrading, contract grading, or specifications grading, which we unfortunately just don't have the time to get into the details about what these are today. Uh, but we do have a resource on alternative grading that I'll drop in the chat here if you want to learn more. Um, but these can allow you to build in uh, flexibility into your structure of your course in a way that feels a little less punitive than maybe uh, typical grading methods. We also encourage you to think about flexible structure in terms of the types of assignments and the way that you structure your assignments. So we'll talk about that token system that we've uh, alluded to throughout the, throughout the session today. So when we talk about tokens, tokens are uh, ethereal <laughs> tokens that students have uh, it, that they can use at any point during the semester um in order to uh ask for an extension so this could be an automatic two-day extension automatic three-day extension 24 hour they could use it to do a rewrite of one of their assignments people have used tokens to uh, turn in a missing assignment at the end of the semester so you can use these tokens in a lot of different ways but the important aspect is that this isn't waiting for students to ask for these uh, extensions. Instead, they already have them and they know they already have them because you've talked about that with them. And they, they know they're allowed to ask for that extension. It's built into the course and it's okay to do so. 
And so that allows our all of our students to access these extensions in a way that um, doesn't make sure it's just our privileged students or those students that are comfortable asking, uh, getting at that question that Jenny asked and a few other people responded to. Um, some other options you have are scaffolding assignments, right? So this could be giving students deadlines throughout the semester for portions of an assignment that builds up to a final, uh, final fully fledged assignment at the end of the semester. This might be something that would be difficult to give extensions on, and that's something to consider. And again, it is okay to have deadlines and to hold to those deadlines with your students. Um, you could consider developing flexible or co-designed rubrics with students in order to keep bring them into that assignment design process. Uh, you can provide choice where possible. So a few folks have talked about this. You may be able to provide choice in topic of an assessment or an assignment or perhaps form. Uh, so for example, form could mean like they're allowed to submit an essay or an infographic or a video or an audio recording. Um, but what you want to really do is make sure you're aligning that with your learning outcomes. Like Hannah mentioned, if you're if the goal of the assignment is for students to get familiar with a particular topic, likely the form matters less. But if, if the uh, important learning outcome is for students to get familiar with or be able to write a paper, um, you'd want to have them still write that paper, but maybe the topic can be a little bit more flexible there. Uh, we encourage you to use a transparent assignment design where and Tilt is a great resource um, that outlines how you can set up and share like a, an assignment sheet with students. So here you'd be sharing the purpose of the assignment. So why are students doing this? The task that they have to do. So what you typically write out, like you need to write a paper that has 10 pages with five sources. Um, so it tells them exactly what they need to do for that task portion. And then finally, you end with the criteria for success. So what are you going to use to evaluate that, whether that's a rubric or student examples can really be uh, related to your course context and what you have available. And I just shared the tilt resource in the chat there uh, if you're interested in learning more. And we'll share all of these resources out at the end of the session um, as a or as a in a follow up email after the session. So you don't have to feel uh, obligated to open all these links and have them there. You'll get them as a resource. And then two final ideas that I have that we have here in terms of flexible structure with assignments is having students complete perhaps a subset of assignments. So, for example, uh, they still get full credit if they do 10 out of 12 discussion board points posts. That way they are still getting all of this um, great uh, ability to engage with the content and with their peers, but they have that built in flexibility and that can also allow you as the instructor. Uh, the flexibility to not have to deal with extensions. So if you want to be able to grade things or assess things all at once, students won't have those extensions because they won't even turn in the assignment because they're only doing 10 out of 12 or four out of six or whatever works for your course such that students are still achieving those learning outcomes, but maybe don't have to do exactly everything. Um, and then similarly, another way to get around that extensions um, issue could also be to drop lowest grades. So maybe you don't provide extensions, but instead you drop their lowest two or three quiz grades. Um, and that's just uh, a lot of ideas that you have that you can kind of mix and match to make a system that is both flexible uh, enough for you and structured enough for you, but also works for your students. We have another uh, student quote because we love hearing what our students have to say about how we design our courses and, and what works best for them. And something that uh, will lead us into our conversation about strategies that you can use in course design is uh, this quote. So uh, this student partner talked about planning around burnout at the end of the semester in your syllabus. Professors often acknowledge that burnout exists and that students may be, um, but they don't respond. So think about quality over quantity and perhaps how to reduce content or teach material in a less stressful way at times when you know students and you uh, will be overwhelmed. So by typically do build up as the semester goes on, but it would be better if it got heavier and then got lighter again. You can build in leniency and understanding. So less can be more when it comes to content in your course. Try not to use that end of the semester to jam in everything that you weren't able to get to. And you can make intentional decisions about what is most important for your course and what content is most important for your students to come away from your course with. 
we talk about flexible structure and course design. So one option you or one strategy is to have a general course design course routine. So for example, assignments are always due at a certain time, or uh, we have Monday is our content day and Thursday is our discussion day. So having that same structure allows students to know exactly what they're supposed to do on any given day and uh, get across to them that they don't have to have that cognitive load of thinking, oh, is it Monday? Is it Thursday? What's due on this day? It's just the same every week. You can be transparent with your course design. So talk with students about why your course is designed the way that it is and communicate that to our students like we've talked about a lot today. Um, you can build flexibility into your course schedule. So for example, you may find that you leave a few class sessions open so you don't have a topic for that day. And then you can build that in based on what you've learned about your students and what they're interested in learning or other topics that may come out come up throughout the semester. Some people build in mental health days to their syllabus, so they may have just one day where you don't meet for class and, and that maybe that happens around a very stressful time of the semester and that just allows students to kind of catch up. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, you can try to co-create class norms to promote shared accountability and transparency. And we talked about that at the beginning when we shared our guidelines for this uh, for this workshop. You can do a similar thing with your students um, to make sure everyone's kind of on the same page there. And then lastly, our last set of uh, strategies is to think about flexible structure in terms of class sessions. So an individual class uh, meeting as opposed to course design as a whole. So again, similar idea, have a general class routine. So your class could run in the same way uh, every, every time you meet. So you may start with a warm up, do a short lecture, then do activities and end with a wrap up or a reflection. And that uh, general class routine will obviously change depending on your course, but it's a good, uh, good idea to have that. You can also provide choice here where possible. Um, so if you're doing assignments or, or activities in class, they could get choice in who they work with or perhaps work modality, like we provided you all with today, the ability to work individually or in groups. What you wanna do there is think about what your learning outcomes are. So if students need to talk to each other in order to achieve those learning outcomes, maybe it's more important for them to be in a group that day, but maybe it's less important for other days and you can build that in. Um, you can also build in options for participation or discussion. So you may find that it's important to set a certain amount of time for discussion, but allow choice in topic modality again, so maybe using online tools or verbally, um, or making room for that discussion to go in various uh, various potential directions. And then finally, as you um, move throughout your course or throughout a particular class session, think about where you can condense or expand activities on the spot. You actually saw us model this a little bit today when we did the chat check-in after, um, or when we did the brief debrief after the, um, after you all were in your breakout rooms, we didn't actually have that planned, but we built that in because we had a little bit of extra time. And so we uh, we didn't have that planned originally in our schedule, but we thought that if we had the extra time, we'd be able to do that. And so we thought about where we could condense or expand our activities on the spot. So we're planning for flexibility and really being intentional about when we could increase time on a particular topic. So what that leaves us with, actually, before we move there, um, I know I shared a lot of information uh, and there's a lot, there could be some questions. So I wanna leave space uh, in case there are questions that folks have. We probably have time for maybe one question here because we're almost at the end of our session. All right, so if we don't have any questions, we'll move into our final reflection, which is just a simple, um, and you can share in the chat or you're welcome to just kind of uh, think about this and take it with you as you move throughout the rest of your day, uh, which is to think about the question, what is one approach you plan to apply this semester to incorporate flexible structure? We see uh, Harmeen mentioning that they loved when professors dropped their lowest grade. Uh, Naupo talking about using token system. I'm 
trying out some different grading systems. Ooh, lots of stuff in there. I see lots of people thinking about the tokens. Um, so I will uh, make sure to provide a little bit more guidance on how to do that when we share our follow-up resources. I have a good resource that gives you some things to think about when developing that token system. And I also see lots of people talking about uh, reducing demands towards the end of the semester and really thinking about that course rhythm or the course routine and how it, how it flows throughout the, the semester. Hannah, are you seeing anything you wanna mention? I think that's that's what's standing out to me as well. And I think hopefully it's because that student quote resonated and that I remember that conversation with the students, even myself being a bit surprised when they described, you know, like the syllabus shouldn't just be a constant growth towards this like massive project at the end, because we do that in all of our classes. Like, could you imagine if like the hardest part of the semester was the middle when we're really like ready for it <laughs> and our minds are ready and we're not burnt out? Yeah, it's just that's a great point. Like more of a an up and a down, but something food for thought. And thank you all so much for attending. Um, Victoria has just put a link in the chat to our uh, feedback survey. And if you know us, you know we love feedback, um, and we really appreciate it. And apply it to any time we'll do this next session and all of our other sessions. So we really appreciate it if you could fill that out. Um, and there are a few other related workshops next Wednesday that you might find interesting uh, that are listed on the slide, trauma informed teaching, incorporating current events into your teaching, and potentially uh, compassionate responses and using calling in for discussions. So thank you all so much, um, and we really appreciate you being here today. Uh, yes, happy to show you the learning outcome slide. Uh, that's